still have some people trickling in, but I wanted to get us started on time. Um, thank you all for coming to today's lecture, Political Breakdown, uh, How to Understand the 2016 Presidential Election, uh, with our visiting lecturers, John Scythe and Lynn Vavrick. Um, I want to thank them for making the trip here to Athens. We're so pleased to have them. Um, I am Jan Hebbard. I am an outreach archivist with the Richard B. Russell Library for Political Research and Studies, which is the political archives here on campus. We have a gallery just down the hall, and our research room is on the third floor of this building. Um, this is one event in a series of our fall events called Ready, Steady, Vote, uh, a series of community forums, debate watch events, lectures, uh, and other screenings and performances that are meant to motivate citizens to think critically about uh, the 2016 election. So uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, I also thank the Department of Political Science, who's our co-sponsor in today's lecture, and um, invite you all to attend the reception that will follow this immediately after uh, in the hallway just outside. And now I would like to invite uh, Dr. Keith Poole to come up and introduce our speakers for the afternoon. Well, I'm going to resist my natural tendency to filibuster, <laughs> since I really want to hear what uh, uh, Lynn and John have to say. I'm very pleased to do this introduction because um, I want to plug this book, which is outstanding. Um, and I really want to hear what they have to say. Uh, I'm 69, and uh, I've been following politics uh, since 1958, and this is the strangest election that I can remember. So I really want to hear what they have to say about it. I think, let, let me make a plug here because um, I happen to be, I have the good fortune of my health improving enough that uh, I was able to go up to New York City last uh, weekend to go to an event in honor of Robert Erickson and a lot of uh, people that are in this area, uh, I personally don't do uh, elections, um, namely uh, Jim Stimson and Chris Valasian and Tom Palfrey and uh, a real murderer's row of heavy hitters. Um, and basically, uh, I'll cut to the chase and then I want to say something about their book. Um, and they are, uh, being a, a, a math nerd, as many of you may know, uh, when I started reading this book, I read the appendices first. <laughs> and, and they are oppressive as hell. <laughs> yeah. uh, what I really like about the, this book is that um, they have very large sample sizes, sizes which mean they, means they can dispose of all this nonsense you usually see the pundits uh, writing about during the election, which is, is really nonsense. So let me, let me uh, 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 the basic message of the gamble, uh, which remember this book is about uh, the, uh, the race between uh, President Obama for re-election and uh, his opponent Mitt Romney, but it's actually a two-part book. It has first the primaries, Republican primaries, and then the general. And they're, uh, one of the things that they pound on, uh, which is very important, is that keep your focus on the fundamentals. Do the math. And when you read the appendices, you can see how wrong uh, people like Karl Rove and other people were uh, in newspaper columnists. And basically, in the, the, in the, the, the importance of this book uh, is that is the sheer sample sizes of, the, uh, of the, the surveys they were using. So for example, in the primaries, they were able to take these very large sample sizes and run sophisticated econometric models uh, to basically show that there's no substitute for broad support within the party. And that's the lesson of 2012. And contrary to what people think, uh, Mitt Romney was actually very conservative and just sailed along. The reason he kept sailing along 
is that in fact he was fairly close to the median Republican and was almost always the second choice of Republicans. And um, broad support to, uh, within a, the party uh, dominates media and momentum. And so they have this really wonderful analysis of basically the rise and fall of people like uh, uh, Herman Cain and, and, uh, and Gingrich and uh, uh, Perry, who was uh, barely showed show, show the pulse and so forth. Um, when they get to the general election, um, of course, this year is a little different because it is an open seat race, technically. You've got, basically, you don't have an incumbent president running for re-election. But in 2012, you had an incumbent president for, uh, running for re-election. And in that case, to just to simplify uh, their model down a little a bit, um, their forecasting model basically boils down to economic, the performance of the economy, and the approval of the president, whether how warm or how well they regard the president. And contrary to what a lot of people believed, um, we, uh, President Obama had it in the bag a year in advance. The reason was, um, even if you think the economic recovery was anemic, which it really, which it was actually, um, it still was the case it was growing and Obama was popular. And if I'm not mistaken, uh, they do this interesting thing, I can't remember if it's in the text or in the appendix, where they take, I think, the forecast, they do a forecast, I think, from uh, November of uh, 2011, and they predicted 52%, if I remember correctly. And they only, and the under, and the under that was an underestimate of only one point. Uh, if you want to see the power of this model, and by the way, they give uh, fair credit to uh, Bob Erickson and Chris Malaysia who developed a model very similar to this. Um, uh, you look at figure 7.1, and it is an absolute, it's a home run over the center field wall, all right? So that um, I would, you know, any, anyone who's uh, interested uh, in American politics should read this book and then uh, basically I think it sets the standard uh, for future analyses. Uh, this bizarro election we're in now, uh, I just don't have any idea. And I really want to hear about it. So I am going to stop. Without further ado, uh, John Sides and uh, Lynn Varro. Thank you all very much. Uh, it's such a pleasure to be here uh, in Athens at the University of Georgia. Uh, thank you to Keith for such a lovely introduction. I didn't realize that the title of the series was Ready, Steady, Vote. Um, I, I didn't think about the word steady uh, when I started thinking about this particular election, but it's an interesting point of contrast, perhaps. Uh, the, the book that Keith is referring to about 2012 is ironically called The Gamble, uh, which is a title that I wish we had saved uh, for our forthcoming book on the 2016 election. Um, but, you know, uh, it, it, there are things about this race that are, needless to say, hard to predict, and also some things about this race that are quite a bit different than 2012, and we'll try to highlight a few points of contrast um, as we go along. So here are, I think, uh, the, some of the main, main ideas that we want to convey to you guys here with um, a few weeks to go before the 2016 election. Um, I'm going to talk first about the sort of three reasons why this isn't a Clinton landslide. Um, I live in Washington, D.C. Uh, lots of liberals and Democrats in Washington, D.C. Can't understand why they have to sort of like be anxious or why they can't sleep at night. Shouldn't this be easy for us this year? Come on, what's the matter? Sides, explain it to us. And I, I try to say that it's not supposed to be easy. It's not supposed to be a landslide. It's not supposed to be a year, as Keith suggested in about 2012, which was you know kind of where the fundamental features of the national economy and other things predicted a democratic victory. So I'm gonna first talk about the fundamentals predicting in this year a toss up. Um, and then secondly, one of the other things that's working in some sense to keep the election closer than some people think it should be is partisanship. And, and partisanship, in particular, keeping a candidate like Trump 
uh, who may have other liabilities, somewhat in range of Clinton. Uh, and we live, for better or worse, in partisan times. And I think that's pretty much manifest in the way that both Democrats and Republicans think about their candidates this year. And then finally, um, you may have noticed that uh, Donald Trump's name come, comes up in the news occasionally. Every once in a while, you might see his name on the, on the, on the headlines or on a news story of some kind. And I think that, the, in some sense, he's banking on that. I mean, and that's, that's been his strategy since the art of the deal, right? Since he sort of articulated his theory of the case in terms of how you do what he does. Um, and it's working to keep him close in as much as the news coverage is not, at least until the last week, okay, sort of consistently more favorable to Clinton than it is to Trump. And despite of whatever controversies attend him, I think the news, as a, if the news is part of the information that voters are relying on, it's in some sense been closer to parity than sometimes we might think, and certainly than some people think is appropriate. But at the same time, even if it's not meant to be a landslide in Clinton's favor, there are these sort of two unknowns, two questions of the Trump campaign that's confronting, which Lynn's gonna talk a little bit about. One is about his basic message, a message that I think focuses quite a bit on anxiety towards and about minority groups in this country, different times, African Americans, uh, immigrants, Latinos, Muslims. Is that a message that's sort of effective enough to win in a country that's every year becoming less white and less Christian? And then secondly, um, can a presidential candidate run an am amateurish campaign and, and, and still win? You may remember <coughs> that Trump once had a television show, of course, called The Apprentice. Okay? That is, should be the title of his presidential campaign. He is an apprentice, <laughs> right, auditioning for a role that he is not trained to do. And the question ultimately is whether this is going to prove to be a liability for him. All right, so let's talk a little bit um, about the fundamentals. You may remember this question that Clinton asked, I think kind of rhetorically, um, relatively recently. Why am I not 50 points ahead? I don't literally think she thinks she should be 50 points ahead. Uh, but it's a nice point of contrast when we're thinking about the fundamentals. Um, this is the famous figure 7.1 from the gamble. Uh, <laughs> uh, this is a classic political science take on the relationship between economic conditions and uh, how well the incumbent party, the president's party, does um, in the election. So this is the incumbent's percent of the major party votes. So take the third party candidates out of it and just count the percent of the vote of Democrats and Republicans. And this is the growth rate in, in, in gross domestic product over the uh, sort of quarter one to quarter three of the election year. That's non-annualized, um, but that doesn't make a difference. Some of you who remember the 1980s will remember that the economy wasn't so good in 1980, and it certainly wasn't good for Jimmy Carter. Um, but there are years, like 1984, when the economy is growing relatively rapidly in the year prior to the election, and that made a big difference for an incumbent president like Ronald Reagan. Um, you'll see the 2012 right there in the middle. Right? We just, just underestimated Obama's margin of victory, but not by much. Um, and so, you know, if we were to put a rough estimate of how much we think gross domestic product is going to grow in these first three quarters on that line, what would we predict, right? You see it's basically sitting right at 50%, maybe slightly above. The just tiniest edge for the Democrats, but not much, just based on one economic statistic. So that, in alone, that alone predicts a toss-up. In addition, there are a set of models estimated by other political scientists. I like to think of these people as like, you know how people have like an old classic car in their garage that they tinker with? Right? This is kind of like these guys and their, their, their models of the election. They're all a little bit different, but many of them are grounded in similar kinds of fundamentals, like how is the economy doing, how popular is the incumbent president, things like that. So um, the website Vox.com did a roundup of the different predictions that, so I think six of these models made. And here they are, uh, listed with the name of a scholar that sort of developed the model, including the one by Bob Erickson and Chris Blazin that, that Keith mentioned. And you'll notice that there's not a consistent story. Right? So the first model predicts a Republican win, the next one Democratic win, Democratic win, a very narrow Democratic win, a Republican win, a fairly easy Republican win. What Vox did was have two political scientists take these models, average their predictions together, weighting the predictions so that the models that have performed best in the past 
get more weight than models that haven't performed as well in the past, because not everyone's hard drives as well, no matter how much tinkering they do with it. And you can see what the result of that was. 50.9% of the major party vote for the Republicans, 49.1% for the Democrats, right? A toss up. So this is, again, you don't have to trust one economic statistic. You can look at a range of models, trying to do similar things, and you come away with the same basic picture. It's supposed to be close. It's supposed to be a toss-up. So if you have to evaluate this election outcome um, on the night of the election, no matter whether you're you know, smiling or in tears, right, you have to have that as your baseline. You know, was it a good campaign? Was it a big victory? Was it a wipeout? Was it close? You know, what's the, what's, what are you comparing the outcome to? I would say compare it to the <coughs> prediction that it was supposed to be a toss-up. All right, so then we go to the current polls and the, and the role of partisanship. And so this is the pollster.com um, trend line for the candidates over time. And you know, you, you, most of you have stared at this many times, you know, perhaps multiple times a day, depending on how neurotic you are. Uh, and you can see changes recently, you know, in and around the conventions. You can see uh, a little change after the first debate, at the very end of that. Clinton now has about a six point lead, averaging the polls together at this point in time. But what you may notice about that is that, you know, once Trump enters the race, after a period of a month or two, his poll numbers sort of hit about 44, 43%, and they start to bounce around, but they're not dropping much below the low 40s, right? Clintons are somewhat above him, right, consistently throughout this time, but Again, the lead that she's getting at most was eight or nine points after the convention, narrowed again, it's, it's widened a little bit more, but we sort of have settled into oftentimes kind of a four to five point lead for her, maybe a little bit less, maybe a little bit more. But this, in some sense, stability plot, you know, in, in, the, in the fact that we're not dealing with you know, wide, durable gaps is a function of partisanship. We live in a world in which party, uh, Republicans and Democrats in the electorate are increasingly loyal to their party's candidate. And moreover, increasingly uh, 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 hateful towards the opposite party's candidate and towards the opposite party. Um, one of the famous uh, investigations of this recently found that um, if you asked people, how would you feel? Would you be upset if your son or daughter married somebody of the opposite party? When that question was first asked in the early 1960s, maybe 5% of people said that would bother them. Now it's more like a third or 45%, depending on the party, would say, no, that would bother me. That would make me upset. Okay. Now maybe that wouldn't be the case once they met the fine young gentleman or, or, or woman right, that was going to be their precious child's betrothed and you know, to have it to hold from this day forward okay, until death do us part. But still, you can see in that kind of statistic Something about partisanship m matters more to us, means more to us than it used to. And so what you end up seeing, right, um, for example, is jokes like this uh, from another political scientist. Uh, this was a tweet by, this is a guy at Sydney, political scientist, even if Trump loses, he'll always have the joyful memory of forcing conservatives to praise his trashing of free trade in the Iraq war, right? <laughs> and then Brendan says, party ID is a hell of a drug, okay? What else would lead you Right, to support a candidate who's trashed positions that have been at the core of your party's leadership and your own personal views for years, if not decades. And if you want to see this working in the electorate, consider the percentage of Republicans and Democrats that support their party's candidate for president, and look at that going back to 1956. All right, so red means percentage of Republicans voting for the Republican candidate, blue means percentage of Democrats voting for the Democratic candidate. Okay? Now you can see early on that there are years in which party loyalty is not 100%, not even 75% necessarily. You know, uh, Republicans defecting from Barry Goldwater in 1964, Democrats defecting from George McGovern in 1972. It didn't always used to be that party members were so loyal. But look at 2000, 2004, 2008, and 2012. So now we live in a world in which Party loyalty is the norm, and it's extraordinarily high, 90% or more. And that was certainly true in 2012. Now flash back a month or two, a few months, and think about 2016. What was going to happen? 
those Bernie Sanders supporters, they would never support a corporate capitalist sellout like Hillary Clinton, right? How could she possibly unify the Democratic Party? Donald Trump, right? Unorthodox positions on any reign, a number of, of, ish, of, of kind of core parts of the Republican Party platform. How could he possibly unify the Republican Party? They didn't, okay? Rates of party loyalty are only slightly below what they were in 2012, and I mean, these are current polls, so we still have a few weeks to go, right? To do a little bit more of that work of ensuring that the partisan faithful right, stay in the fold. So this is one thing that makes it difficult in a country in which there's a relatively even distribution of Democrats and Republicans, maybe a few more Democrats than Republicans. When parties are this loyal to their candidates, it means that it's difficult for one candidate to really open up a wide, durable landslide-like lead in the polls. Okay, so that's the partisanship story. Let's talk a little bit about the news story. So I want to distinguish two things in the news. One is how much coverage the candidate gets, and the other is, is that coverage on balance negative or positive? Okay, so this is uh, data from a group that has been scraping the websites of the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, the Chicago Tribune, Slate, Politico, Fox News, and the Weekly Standard. A mixture of mainstream and sort of more you know, conservative news sources in a couple of cases. And what they're trying to get is um, what, how many stories have these candidates been mentioned in? Um, and what they're finding over time, so this starts back in July 2015, um, if you would like to see a graph that goes back to, um, that, that uh, focuses on Trump in the primaries compared to the other Republican candidates, buy our book for about 2016 in about a year. Uh, and you'll see, of course, Trump's dominance in the primary was <coughs> sort of constant. But if you just compare the two candidates even before they were the nominees and then follow them forward, what you'll see is that Trump gets more coverage than Clinton. This, this takes us all the way through September 13th. Okay, so there's a few more weeks after this point in time. Um, but already you can see there's a lot of coverage about Trump, less coverage about Clinton. Even after the first debate, so I asked these guys, hey, tell me what happens in the 48 hours after the debate. The debate that Clinton won, right, remember? She wins the debate and gets one third of the coverage of Donald Trump. Right? So Donald Trump, even in defeat, right, gets more coverage than Clinton. Okay, so Trump, from a, from a long time, has made getting publicity, good or bad, his theory of how you succeed in life, business, television, whatever he tries his hand at. And in some sense, he's able to do that successfully in this campaign. So then the question is, what about the tone of the coverage? Maybe getting a lot of coverage isn't so good if it's really negative, and maybe Clinton getting less coverage isn't so bad if it's all positive. So what these guys did is they took the, the, the words in these stories, and they, they took the words and they looked at the adjectives in particular, and they, they, they matched those to sort of dictionaries where you know kind of whether the adjective is a good or bad word. So the computer algorithms do that these days. It's not perfect, right? So if I'm sarcastic, right, it's difficult to, to, to figure that out just from having a computer scan text. But these are news stories, right? So there's not a lot of sarcasm in news stories. So words about trailing, failing, struggling, right, would be like, oh, bad words. You know, winning, that's a good word, okay? <laughs> right. So what is the balance of the tone of the coverage look like? So this dates from June to 2016 um, to September the 28th. And so it's median sentiment. Sentiment is sort of a synonym for positive or negative, how, how what's the tone of the coverage. And what you'll see here is, the, the maximum it could be is one. The minimum it could be is negative one. And you'll see that the axis here goes from 0.03 to 0.14. Very narrow range, given what's theoretically possible. What this tells you is that most news is not strongly tilted towards either candidate most of the time. Not strongly tilted. Dare I say, this sounds quaint, most news coverage is fairly objective. Okay. Okay. But it's true. It's fairly objective. That's why you don't get <coughs> big numbers, right? Close to one or close to negative one. What you'll also notice is it's not clear that one candidate has any kind of consistent advantage. So you can see Clinton having a nosedive in June and July, right? in particular at a time when there's a lot of stories about the email server. Okay. 
You can see, however, Clinton's surge, at least to some extent, at the very end in those 48 hours after the debate. But on balance, you would not say the one candidate has a consistent advantage. For every story about the Trump Foundation, there are stories about the Clinton Foundation. Okay? For every story about what Donald Trump said about so-and-so, there's a story about the emails again. Okay? So in some sense, both candidates are being covered in somewhat similar ways if you take the broadest possible picture of it. Okay? Now, what remains to be seen is whether what's happened to Trump in the last week is a durable feature for the next four or five weeks, or whether, in fact, the coverage will shift a little bit back towards more closer to parity. But in some sense, this, I think, is one of the things that helps Trump keep the race a little bit close. It's not the case that he is being covered in a distinctly negative way, at least if you look over the broad sweep of the general election campaign. OK, so that picks us back to these questions. Um, we have three things that Lynn and I would argue keep the race relatively close to an equilibrium that we would expect based on the fundamentals of the country and the role of partisanship in the information environment that the news provides. And yet, okay, it's not a toss-up race right now. Right? She, Clinton has a six-point lead in the national polls and in some sense is favored to win. Trump is the underdog. And so this raises questions about um, Trump's message and his campaign, how these things matter, uh, and whether these things can help him change that situation. So, Lynn. Thank you. Great to be here. Um, all of these things that John talked about are things that we like to think of as the stage dressing for this great play that is about to happen in front of us, the presidential campaign. And so the economy, partisanship, the news, that's the, the dressing and the props on stage. But there's another important part of the experience, which is what the actors are going to do in front of that backdrop. And that's what I'm going to talk about here in terms of Trump today, but we're happy to talk in the Q&A about Clinton too. What effect have his decisions about the kind of play that he's carrying out, what effect have those things had on the state of the race today and what's likely to happen um, as we go through the next 33 days. So the play that we are all seeing in front of that backdrop of a close predicted election is Make America Great Again versus Stronger Together. Okay, so the two candidates taking very different messaging strategies. Since neither one of them benefits from the state of the nation's economy, neither one of them can go out and say, hey, kick the other party out or, hey, put my party back in, either because they haven't delivered you the goods or because I have delivered you the goods. So we're in this state of play where both candidates are trying hard to focus the election off of this slowly growing economy and onto something else on which they benefit more than their opponent. So they're looking for an issue that they can leverage where their opponent is stuck in an unpopular position they're on the right side of that issue relative to the population. And the issue is or can be made to be important. Now, somewhat coincidentally, they both stumbled on the same issue. And it may seem that the Clinton campaign message is a reaction to Trump's message, but in fact, it's not. Both of these, well, we don't know a lot about how Donald Trump has come up with this message. But the Clinton message, which we know was constructed in the typical ways that presidential campaigns do message testing and do polling to put together a campaign strategy theme and message, that was put together in June of 2015 at least, because the first instance of it is that early. Okay, so it's not a reaction to Trump's Make America Great Again. So both of these candidates, for some reason, think that they're on the right side of this issue, whatever this is. Okay, so we want to keep that in the back of our minds um, as we're talking about this. What exactly are these guys fighting over? And so we'll, we'll take a look at Trump's approach to this. 
So he has run some campaign commercials, not very many, as you know, but he's run some. And he's telling the story about Make America Great Again through a lens of in-group, out-group conflict, through security of our nation, and through general fear, okay, anxiety. This is a very anxious campaign, okay, or anxiety-producing campaign, maybe for lots of reasons. But in his view, he is trying to tap into something that he thinks exists in the electorate. And what is that? Well, Make America Great Again in itself is a great indicator for what he's trying to get you to think about. Make America Great Again means that it was once great, but is not now great, but can be great, and I will make it that way. So he's asking everybody to think back to whatever they think was a time when America was great, um, and think about how we can get there. And he's the guy to take us there. And he tells that story in his language through the pronouns he uses. If you listen to his events, you can hear him say, we, meaning our supporters here, we know this, and they, and whoever they are, sometimes it's the media, sometimes it's those protesters outside, sometimes it's uh, you know, Hillary Clinton and her band of cronies. So there's always a they, and they are in contrast to his group in the, in the room. And he uses that kind of language all the time. In the debate the other night, he referred to Barack Obama, to Hillary Clinton, he said, your president. Not, not our president, your president, that guy. So he's always distancing himself and his supporters from this other group. Um, and then he's, he's doing that very early on in his campaign. But then we have these terrorist attacks in Paris, in San Bernardino. And he extends his envelope a little bit and incorporates that into this idea. And suddenly, it's not just about immigration or us versus them, where they are the people who are here illegally. But now, it's about national security, and it's about terrorism, and it's about keeping the terrorists, keeping them, the terrorists, out. Um, and then we have some po the police violence and the conflicts uh, in our communities. And he extends the envelope a little more to incorporate that kind of fear and safety as well. I wouldn't say it was a strategy, a long-term strategy. I think it's more of a tactic. He, in the same way that he's a salesman, he kind of knows that these attitudes existed in the population. Okay, so it's important to say Donald Trump is not creating these attitudes. They've existed for a long time, and people who study public opinion know that. But he is making them more important in this year. He's recognizing that this is a moment in time where this particular message would resonate with people. And so one of the questions is, will it resonate enough? OK, so in the primary, in the Republican primary, we already know the answer to that was yes. He tapped into a segment of the electorate that paid off for him. And so what we've got for you here are data from the American National Election Study pilot survey in February of 2016. And on the y-axis, we always have Donald Trump's share of the vote in the primary. Okay, so this is vote share. As his vote goes up, votes for all the other candidates on average have to go down. Okay, and on the x-axis, in both of these cases, we're showing you two different measures of what we might call white consciousness or white identity. So these are questions that ask white people to think about whites as a group and what kind of threat they might be facing. This question asks people to tell the survey taker how likely it is that whites are going to lose jobs to minorities in the future. And you can see, as you move along this axis, the more likely you are to think that whites are going to lose jobs to minorities, the more likely you are to be a supporter of Donald Trump. Okay, so there's a very nice relationship here. There are people in all of these outcomes. Okay, it isn't as if nobody's over here. Okay, so the more likely you think it is that whites are going to lose jobs to minorities, the more likely you are to have voted for Donald Trump. The same thing over here. How important do you think it is for whites as a group to come together to prevent or to change laws that are unfair to whites? Okay, so is that something we should be doing? 
And the more important you think it is, the more likely you are to be a Trump voter in the Republican primaries. So he not only recognized that there was a distribution on these attitudes here that he could leverage, but he successfully went out and made this thing important in delineating the vote in the Republican primary. By the way, I should say that if we did this for other years, for other candidates, if we did this in 2012 for Mitt Romney vote, we would get bunches of flat lines. Okay, so this really is something particular about 2016. So he has essentially changed the dimensions on which the Republican primary was being fought. So here's another example of how these attitudes about race and ethnicity have been made to be important by Trump. Here we've got for you Hillary Clinton's <coughs> vote share now. Now we're in the general election. Hillary Clinton's vote share in contests in the red line against Donald Trump and in the black line is the average of Cruz and Rubio. They're fairly similar. Okay, on the x-axis here is a measure of racial anxiety. Okay, so do you have very liberal attitudes about race and ethnicity, or do you have conservative attitudes about race and ethnicity? So this is a scale, and as you can see, the structure here is roughly the same. Um, the, 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 the people with more racially liberal attitudes tend to vote for the Democrat, and the opposite over here, but the slope of these lines is different. And so when the contest, when we ask People, if the election were held today and it's a contest between Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump, who would you vote for? This measure of racial anxiety is separating people to a greater degree than when we ask people if the election were held today and it's a contest between Hillary Clinton and Marco Rubio, who would you vote for? These are data from March of 2016 before we knew that Trump would for sure be the nominee. So all the work he's doing in the primary to stress us versus them, in-group, out-group, to prime attitudes about race and ethnicity are not only working in the primary, but they're helping to structure the general election vote as well. So Trump has successfully refocused the 2016 election off of a middling economy and onto people's racial attitudes. And the question is, is this a winning strategy? Okay, so, and he's done it really explicitly, which is, I think, one of the things people find completely compelling. Who would say these things out loud? I've heard some people say, oh, you know, people say these things, but nobody says it out loud, and nobody says it when they're running for president. Okay, so other presidential candidates in previous years have hinted at things like America first or patriotism, but very few candidates go all in on this kind of messaging. So Trump recognizes these attitudes exist. He's not creating them. He makes them really important. But the question is, is there a payoff for him? Right, so is he gaining more white voters? By the way, these are, these are just white voters. So is he gaining more white voters here than he's losing here? Okay, not sure yet. But one of the things that should give him pause is that the face of the nation is changing. And so while in 1976 we were mainly white, about 90% of the electorate, today that number is about 20 points less. It's about 70%. And so there are fewer and fewer people in this set to come and vote for, to come and vote for Trump, sorry. Um, as he makes this thing more and more important. So the set of people on which this is operating is shrinking. Okay, so certainly for the party, this is a bad gamble. Okay, but for Trump in 2016, we'll see what happens. So the second thing that is relevant in thinking of the play that's happening in front of us and how unusual 2016 is, is the fact that Donald Trump has basically decided to stay home and not campaign. And he has a major uh, spending or fundraising imbalance. Okay, so everybody thought a year and a half ago this was gonna be a $2 billion election. And for the last several cycles, the amount of money candidates have raised has doubled every presidential year. 
Donald Trump has spent about as much money, or has raised about as much money, I should say, this is raised money, has raised as much money almost as John McCain did in 2008. Now, if you're really a geek and you love presidential campaigns, right now you're saying to yourself, like, wait a minute, in 2008, John McCain took federal financing for his campaign, and Barack Obama didn't. They shook hands and they said, yeah, we're both going to take federal financing. And then Barack Obama said, see ya, I'm not doing that. And John McCain did it. And so there was a massive spending imbalance in 2008. And Donald Trump not taking federal financing, that program still exists, you know, but he didn't take it. But he is about at McCain's 2008 level. People talked in 2008 about how that spending imbalance did McCain in. Now, that's not what we were saying, because we knew, according to the fundamentals, the Republicans were always losing in 2008, okay, global financial crisis. But that's, that's how big this imbalance is. And because he isn't out there raising and spending money, he has actually made the Democrats raise and spend less money. So we're not going to get to $2 billion. If you are somebody who, for the last 12 years, has been saying, we got to get the money out of politics, you know, it's way too, you know, $2 billion, like, we can't spend this much, well, this is what you get. You want 2016 again? Probably not. Okay, so it's, it's an unusual year in so many ways. So another way that Donald Trump has signaled his low effort in this election is through television advertising. So since June of 2016, we have had about 211,000 ad airings. So that's not unique ads, that's actual spots on TV. This is how they break down. Priorities USA is a super PAC advertising on behalf of Clinton. So almost all the advertising is being done on behalf of Hillary Clinton. And then a small remainder is being done on behalf of Donald Trump. Now everybody said, oh, but that imbalance doesn't matter because, like John showed you, he's getting covered in the news so much more, right? His name was in like a zillion more headlines than Hillary Clinton, you just saw that. Okay, and people said, oh, that's gonna erase this ad imbalance and maybe he's crazy like Fox. Maybe he doesn't have to spend the money and he is a really great businessman. So, what John and I have tried to do is get some idea of the effect of that advertising imbalance. This is a picture of, of the imbalance. So from May of 2016 until last week, this is Clinton's share of the ad purchase, okay, all of those ads. And here is that moment where she goes up on the air and he's not advertising. And this is everybody's freaking out. This is everybody saying like, oh my gosh, Trump's not answering the ad buy. Oh my gosh, he doesn't have any money to answer the ad buy. This is gonna be a blowout, a disaster. Okay, so this is that period. The blue and red lines are just giving you two key media markets, Tampa and Cleveland, so you can see specifics, but this is the national average. And then in about July, he starts advertising, or groups on his behalf start advertising a little bit, and then there's a consistent effort and we get to parity um, after the conventions. Okay, so that's the, comp the competitive advertising space. And what we have done is tried to take all of the states where there have been no advertising by either candidate and think of them as the control states. So those, those are states where there's been no messaging. And then look at all the other states where there has been some advertising, sometimes more for Clinton, sometimes more for Trump, and say, what's the effect of those ads? And day by day, state by state, we can estimate this using, with a little help from Nate Silver at 538.com and the state daily polling averages. And what we find out is that just because Clinton's vote share is shrinking over this period, so she's sort of up high and then she's kind of reverting to that mean prediction we told you about in the beginning, doesn't mean that her ads are not effective. In places like Ohio, Nevada, and Florida, where she advertised a lot, she picked up about two points of vote share over this summer period. In the states where neither candidate advertised, the kind of control states, she lost three and a half points of vote share. Now this isn't perfect, it's not a randomized experiment. She's choosing where to advertise on purpose. But people don't usually choose where to spend their money in places where they're already winning. Okay, you advertise in places that are really close or where you're just far behind. 
You're not going to go into the places where you're two points ahead already. Okay, in um, places like Arizona, where she decided she was going to try to make it competitive, instead of losing three and a half points like she did on average in places where she didn't advertise, where there was no advertising, in Arizona, she picked up three points of vote share. Okay, so that's a six point swing from the average. So just because she didn't sort of that 50 point lead she talked about, doesn't mean that that summer advertising buy was ineffective. And so does Donald Trump's staying home, his sort of amateurish campaign, does that seem to be costing him? We think it does. And here's the last bit of evidence on that, number of field offices between the two candidates. So the ground game, are you out there knocking on doors, calling people? Clinton has 291 field offices. The RNC or the Trump organization, it's mostly the RNC, has 88 campaign field offices. That's a big imbalance, it's about three to one. But guess what? In 2012, the Romney-Obama imbalance was three to one. In 2012, we found out that the Obama field offices were uh, a, little, a little more effective, produced more votes than the Romney offices, but guess what? Democrats need to produce more votes than Republicans because their base doesn't turn out and the Republican base does turn out. So this three to one imbalance in field offices might be the right investment for each one of these parties. Here's another interesting little tidbit. 291 field offices by Hillary Clinton is about a third of the number of field offices that Barack Obama had in 2012. Okay, so there are lots of different ways to think about what these candidates are doing. Maybe she doesn't have 800 offices because her opponent is not running a campaign. Um, if she were running against Mitt Romney, who had 291 offices, maybe she'd have 700 offices. Okay, so a little bit, there could be a scaling going on here because Trump is really showing a lack of effort in terms of campaigning. Okay, so that just brings us to where are we with 33 days left, and then we're gonna do your questions. Um, the key fundamentals, as we've tried to convince you, predict a close election, especially that prediction, that key prediction of the state of the nation's economy, okay? Uh, right on the 50% line. But Donald Trump hasn't delivered us that election. And this is just a prediction based on all of these people who are aggregating polls to forecast the election, uh, where, what probability they think it is that Hillary Clinton wins. And it's not vote share, right? It's her chances of winning. And everybody's got her very, very high. Okay, and we have up there on purpose that Donald Trump hasn't delivered this close election. Because we think Hillary Clinton has done her part. She is not a great candidate, right? She's a flawed candidate. She should be beatable. Even given the election is supposed to be 50-50, she's got the FBI director saying that she has questionable judgment. She says, basket of deplorables. She has made her share of campaign mistakes. And yet, Trump is unable to come in and not only win this election, but, but perform at the equilibrium expected level. Okay, one of the things about 2012 is that we say Mitt Romney did about as well as a Republican, average Republican in that year could have done. Donald Trump is not doing as well as an average Republican should have done in 2016. And we'll leave it there and take your questions. Sure, that's a good question. Um, I think it, any of these indicators we think of as, um, as a proxy um, for, in some sense, what voters are perceiving when they think about the economy, when they get information from the news media about the national economy or what have you. Um, I don't think that voters know the GDP rate, you know, or the growth rate of GDP. Um, but we think of it as a proxy for a set of objective conditions which are realized in people's subjective perceptions and then translate into a, a vote choice. Um, the other forecasting models that are out there do it differently um, in terms of which indicators they use. A couple use GDP, others use um, 
real disposable income per capita. Some use uh, indices of, sort of economic in indicators combined together. I think all of these are still basically pointing towards the same story, which is the economy is certainly growing, um, but it's not growing fast enough to, to elect the incumbent party's candidate in a year in which the incumbent president himself is not on the ballot. There's, I, I want to say like two other things about this that we didn't make very clear. This is change in GDP, okay? So it's not the, it's, you know, GDP in itself is growth, but this isn't the level at Q3. This is the change between Q1 and Q3. If you plotted the change in the unemployment rate, you would get a similar looking figure. The slope would not be as steep. If you plotted the level of unemployment, you would get a hot mess and a flat line. So in 1984, for example, where we had this big incumbent party victory, it's morning in America, more people are going to work today than have ever gone before, blah, blah, blah. The unemployment level in 1984 is the same as it was in 2012, a year when everyone was like, oh my god, unemployment's going to kill Barack Obama. So it isn't the level of these things, it's the change. And that means that there's something, we don't know what this relationship is about at the individual level for people, we don't know. But there's something about the trend. And I like to say it's either a rising tide lifts all ships or what happened in the last two weeks is a great predictor of what's gonna happen in the next two weeks, sort of the immediate past is a good guide for the immediate future. And that's why the change is important, where are we headed? But levels of anything are gonna do worse than the change. Yeah. So uh, on the ad buy, I'm not sure if you guys saw this piece, and I'm probably getting it wrong, but uh, somebody had a piece recently that was making the argument that you know, if uh, uh, his deficiencies in the ad buys could be made up for if he ends up buying closer to the election, mm -hmm. would be exciting to the, the gamble. Yeah. Let's see if you guys, what the thoughts were on that. Yeah. Yes, the question is about, so this is a buddy of ours, a co-author of ours, actually, Seth Maskett, wrote a piece in Pacific Standard Magazine a couple days ago. Um, could Donald Trump be holding all his money and advertise only at the end and make up for the deficiencies that have been created now because he's not advertising? And I think we want to say two things about that. Um, the, there's a lot of work in political science about the effects of advertisements, and it's all been done fairly recently, but it, and it's done in really different ways and le different levels of elections. But the takeaway is that the effects of ads are small, and they go away really fast. In presidential elections, the effects go away within a day. Okay? And that's why you typically see candidates fighting it out day by day. Now, a small portion of it accumulates over time, but it's just a small portion. But if you've got a massive imbalance like this, that small portion is really gonna build up day by day. So is there some truck in Donald Trump waiting until five days before the election to advertise? Yeah, I think there is. But is he gonna make up a six point gap five days before the election? There's no way, because she's gonna counter every ad buy he makes in those six days. In fact, she's probably bought up all the advertising time in all the media markets already mm -hmm. in the six days before the election. And he doesn't know, probably, that you have to pay cash in advance because <laughs> he's running an amateur campaign, and she does, and so he's probably going to be stuck. Yeah, I would just add to that, the, the, the data that people have looked at in terms of what he has bought, that he hasn't bought very much going forward. There's nothing, in, there's no, he's reserved no time. So he, he, in some sense, not, it's not even clear he's able to play that strategy because there's no evidence that he's, he's already implemented it. And because he ha is waiting so long, he's going to pay more, right? Because you, you pay less when you reserve farther in advance. And so he's going to get less bang for his dollar as a consequence of this, too. So you know, even if he's able to make a push, he's getting less than he should and she's going to counter. And so the net of that, I don't know, is, is any real gains for him um, at, the, at the end. And then there's it, it, also the question, as Lynn suggested, of what are the consequences of seeding, C-E-D-I-N-G, the, you know, the airwaves to her for this extended period of time. This is not something we typically observe in presidential elections. And it's not quite clear you know, what, the, what we should expect the impact of that to be, and then what, 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 it, mean, what it would mean to come, in the, come in at the very end and try to undo the disadvantage that you've sort of given yourself for 
weeks or months on it. There's no doubt in my mind that if we if we took the ad imbalance in the summer and used it to predict vote choice in November, it'd have a zero effect. Like I almost guarantee it. Um, we saw that in 2012 with the Obama summer ad blitz. But the problem with the Obama summer ad blitz is that that was a myth. Like Obama went up for two weeks and then Romney countered. And you never heard about the Romney ad blitz, but we could see it very clearly in our data. Um, we buy all the advertising data in 2012 from Nielsen and in 2016 from a group that tracks it. Um, and in this case, there's no counter. Uh, but, it's, but it's not going to affect vote choice in November. The way that you can get an effect, if you look at the ad balance in the five days before the election, you'll get an effect of that on vote choice. Yes? Um, could Trump's lack of advertising be made up by uh, his, how many, like how many mentions he gets in the news? Is that possible? Like, could that counteract that lack <coughs> of advertisement that he's had? Um, I would put it this way. Uh, he's six points down. Um, he needs to make up similar kind of ground in at least a handful of battleground states. Um, news coverage is not on net consistently favorable, favorable, more favorable to him than it is to Clinton. And recently, it's less favorable to him than it is to Clinton. Um, it doesn't strike me that he's going to get a real net advantage out of that. And it's not going to be certainly targeted at the places that matter the most. And it's not going to be, in some sense, um, it's not even necessarily going to be the most effective way for him to get those additional votes. I mean, the, the social science literature suggests that some of the most effective ways to do that are person-to-person are -person contact, which is why field offices are valuable. Whether you're doing it just for pure mobilization purposes, go vote, or for some kind of persuasion contact where you're, you think you've isolated some swing voters and you want to have someone call their house and try to convince them to, to swing your way. You know, I, I just don't think relying on the news media is, um, is, is the best strategy. I mean, to some extent, what I think we've been seeing for Trump over the last several um, months is that, hey, it turns out when the news media has two candidates to cover rather than 19, right, when you add the 17 in the Republican Party and the two in the Democratic Party, sorry, Mark and Allen, um, <laughs> it turns out they can learn a lot about you. Um, and it's, 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 I mean, it's, and that's not even considering the ways he gets in his own way by giving the news media things to write about. Like, in, in case you, the Trump Foundation wasn't enough, let me say something about veterans and PTSD. You know, let me double down on Alicia Machado. Um, yeah, so in some sense, I just feel like it's, it's, it, there's not, it's a risky strategy to presume that you're going to get so much good news coverage and Clinton's going to get so much bad news coverage that that's going to, you know, allow you to pull six or seven points of vote share. And that's just... That's a tough order with 33 days left. And here's what's kind of hard about what we're trying to do, though, is since we've been doing this, um, you know, the last couple of cycles, trying to understand why the winner won the election, we have to go look at the campaign as it's actually playing out. And we typically see the effects of these ads in a media environment that looks pretty similar in 12 and 8 you know, both candidates getting equal amounts of coverage and getting pretty neutral tone of coverage. What always drives news coverage in typical presidential campaigns? Poll results. We saw that very clearly in 2012, that when a poll, new poll would come out, it would drive the news coverage. Okay, um, in 2016, this is to say that we don't know the answer to your question, because we've never looked at a snapshot of an election like this, where the news coverage is being driven day by day by the antics of one of the candidates um, and not by the poll numbers. And so I think that John's instincts are all right. It seems like why would you go for this if you know you could just buy ads and you know what that's going to do. Um, and I don't think there's probably that much difference in the news coverage driven by antics or versus poll results. But it is a little bit different. And so, you know, I, we won't know until it's all over and we get to, to see if the ad effects look different this year than they've looked in past years. 
Yeah, I, I, I just want to didn't follow up. Sometimes when, you know, Lynn makes reference to the antics, um, sometimes what you'll see in the way that political observers respond to the controversial things that Donald Trump ever says is they'll say, well, this looks controversial, but that won't cost them any support out there in, you know, we're, we're in real America, right? Not where I live as a journalist in the Beltway, okay? Like the journalists do that thing where they like, to, they like to acknowledge that like they're not real, but like out there are the real people. <laughs> and so whenever you hear someone say, I bet he said this controversial thing, but I bet it won't hurt him. You should say, he's six points down. <laughs> what helps him is the question, not what hurts him, okay? What helps him? Does that help him? PTSD, Machado, Trump Foundation, Trump tax returns, mailed to a New York Times reporter's mailbox, does that help him? Right, that's the question. Right? So I, I want to always flip that sort of, that sort of knowing well it won't hurt him query on his head and say, look, that's not the issue for him. 33 days left, six points down. How are you gonna make it up? And I don't think he's positioned himself to have an easy way to do that. It's not to say it's impossible if something falls from the sky and lands on Hillary Clinton's head, right? <laughs> metaphorically speaking. But it's, it's just, it's just like, like the glass ceiling. I don't know. <laughs> oh, <really? laughs> not yet. No. Not yet. There was a hand. I thought there was one here. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so you were talking about Clint has made mistakes that make her beatable, more beatable than maybe any other race. Um, so does Trump's <clears throat> antics make the people have people react less to Trump's antics? Have, has that mitigated how people have been reacting? I think the story that, that we're trying to say is that people have not underreacted to Trump as much as the media would like you to think. Um, that he should be doing better than he is. Um, you know, so. Yeah, I would say that um, he's, he's not popular. I mean, like, we looked at his favorables a couple, like an hour ago before we came in here just to refresh our memory. And what's, I mean, you know, 25% roughly more Americans have an unfavorable view than a favorable view. That just hasn't changed over time since he got into, like, about a month after he got in the race. It's that, it's that constant. Um, and I think, you know, in a world in which um, Clinton had to run against a generic Republican, with the generic Republicans' troubles. Oh, Jeb, you know, <laughs> Jeb, yeah. you know, when you have to put a, when you have to put an exclamation point after your name, right, you know, to convince people that, you know, uh, that's a problem. Or Rubio, and you know, you could come up with a story about what Rubio's foibles are, but those are garden variety kinds of things. Then Clinton's missteps might stand out because there's not a scandal of comparable magnitude or that plays out in quite the same way. So I just, I, I do think in some sense that, that, Trump is, is probably a candidate, you know, that is not able to let the focus be on her and on her problems, her challenges. And maybe if, if it were a different kind of race, you would see more, I don't know, consequences or additional consequences for her scandals, which have already made her favorable numbers to, you know, second worst of any presidential candidate ever. She's underwater too. Behind only right? Trump, right? Like 14 points or so underwater. It's favorable minus unfavorable. Yes, he, oh, oh sorry. sorry. I was calling on <laughs> non-political scientists. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll call it. Okay, and then we'll do this. As a non-political scientist, <laughs> could you comment on the effect of the independent vote? So if you think about the graph that John showed you where so many, 80% of partisans vote for their party candidate you know, year on year since 2000, um, that stability, usually by this point in the election, Keith talked about this great data set we had in 2012, we had a similar data set in 2008. We have one again this year. And so it's unusual because we do a big survey of people in December of the year before the election, and then we can interview those people over time, and we can actually see who's moving around. So um, there's a lot of stability. Typically by this point in time, 93% of the people who said they would vote for Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump or Mitt Romney or Barack Obama in December are voting for them now. So there's a lot of stickiness there. Um, this year there's less stickiness. And so we're seeing more volatility over the course of the campaign. 
Who are those people who move? They are people who are less partisan, okay, people who are less interested in politics, who don't know how they feel about issues, who don't know how to rate the candidates on favorability measures. So they're a little bit dialed out. Um, now, this is usually the point where someone says, but I'm an independent, and I love politics, and I'm not dialed out, and that's fine. There are those people, too. Um, do they move more than partisans? Yes, they do. But not <laughs> probably, there aren't very many pure independents, right? Maybe 9, 10% of the electorate if you nudge them, are you closer to one party? Are you closer to one party? You know, 9% will never give you a lean. So there aren't very, very many of them. Um, and so the election, people are, oh, does the election come down to like, you know, 100 independent voters in Ohio? No, it doesn't. Um, it comes down to what's going on in the country, what the backdrop of the play is, and what the messages that the candidates send to you, what, you know, how the play carries itself out. Because another really cool thing that we tend not to show, but it's one of my favorite figures from our book, is year by year, if you take any group you want, do states, do demographic groups, um, do partisans and independents, and you plot their vote share in last year to this year, okay? And you can do it 2000 to 2004, four to eight, eight to 12. You will always get those dots lining up on a diagonal line. They're not on a, 45 degree line all the time, so the vote share isn't the same every year, but it moves in the same way. So in 2008, Barack Obama got a lot more votes than John Kerry got in 2004 among all the groups, roughly speaking. And you can choose any groups you want. Um, and that just means that there's some kind of a uniform shift that is happening in all these elections that's nudging everybody one way or another. And for the election to come down to 352 votes in one county in Florida, or 100 independents in Ohio, you really have to be in a unicorn situation where it's 50-50 and you know, it's, it's a highly unusual election. I would, my, one thing I would add to that is that um, there's, a, there's a vein of commentary about elections, which I tend to, it's, it's, like, it's like we fetishize these groups in the electorate. And so it's like, what does this election come down to? It comes down to the independent vote. No, 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 it comes down to college-age women in the <laughs> No, 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 it's about the left-handed, blue-eyed college professors from North Carolina who live in the District of Columbia. I mean, like, so I would just say that, like, people used to say that about independent voters. And then Barack Obama won the election but lost independent voters by a handful of percentage points. And all of a sudden, all these commentators who made their bread and butter talking about independence were like, oh, it's not about independence. Actually, it's about the moderates. You know, so it's like, oh, you're making the same mistake. Right? We're just going to transfer our fetish to a different group. I would say that there's a lot of ways to skin the cat in terms of building a winning coalition in politics. Of course, you can't lose independent voters by 100% to 0%. But you, know, you can have a, a balance of independent voters that ranges from slightly favorable to you to tied to slightly favorable to your opponent and still win the election depending on do your own partisans turn out? How do they vote? Does the other partisans turn out? How do they vote? So to me, I mean, I'm, I, mean I, I certainly would be curious to know in any given election where independents, which way they're leading. But I don't think of that as a bellwether, right, for who's going to actually win the, the election as a whole. Keith, any question? This uh, election is so strange that uh, I wonder whether I, you know, Trump, in my opinion, is a mountebank. And I think W.C. Fields in the back of the line selling, you know, elixirs. Uh, does he really want to win? You know, I mean, he's on he, if you presume that he's not stupid, which I don't think he is, um, does he really want to win? He's not acting like a person who wants to win. And I mean, you know, that's why I find this whole thing so odd. Um, because does he really live in an alternative universe to such an extent that he actually thinks that you can just simply do what he's doing and win? Is he <laughs> is he is he got a psychiatric problem? What? It's just bizarre. I mean, I just find this whole thing totally bizarre. Usually, right, is people who watch you know I don't 
do the detailed stuff either. But, um, you know, it's, I can't think of anything even close to this. And in fact, Jimmy Carter uh, said on the Atlanta TV that uh, his, he thought this was the worst pair of candidates since the Civil War era. And I think he's got a point. But at least Clinton wants to win, which is obvious. Well, I, I hate to, I have no expertise in, 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 in psychology um, or psychiatry. Um, but Trump, I mean, if you, if you take him at his word, he's occasionally said sort of odd, ambiv ambiv ambivalent, ambiguous things about does he really want to win. Um, but he's also said, you know, the opposite, probably more often. I'll take him at his word anymore. I would just say that I, it's, it's harder for me to, to know his, his motivations. Um, but I, I do think that he has a different approach to politics than traditional candidates. And it, it speaks to his uh, preparation and to what things he thinks of as valuable, ways to spend his time. Um, uh, Lynn joked that he you know, stays at home. Of course, he doesn't literally stay at home. He goes and does rallies. You know, he thinks giving, giving speeches and having people come and cheer is is the thing to do, and his sometimes supporters will point to the size of his crowds as evidence that he's going to win. Um, so he seems to have a theory of campaigning that is, it revolves around those activities. And when you ask him or think about doing other things like fundraising or debate prep, um, and or sort of putting together a professional team of experienced campaign consultants who know how to do things like produce television ads, buy them, buy space to air them, put together a ground game you know, do other kinds of policy research or anything else that campaigns do. And he just seems to think that that's unimportant. Um, and again, he may be able to get 45, 46, 47, 48 percent of the vote not doing those things. But again, the question is, what would you have gotten in a world in which his orientation towards campaigning was the traditional orientation of, you know, having a large, professional campaign that can, that can do these things. And I, I think you know, that, that counterfactual may be unrealistic, not only because Trump is Trump, but because part of Trump's sort of um, uh, approach to this whole election was to stand outside of the party institution, the party apparatus. Right? And he sort of explicitly was an outsider and rejected that. That's a little glib, because if you go back and you kind of watch how he got ready for this race, he did start making donations to Republicans, and he got all of a sudden not, he got religion when it comes to guns, okay, Second Amendment stuff. He sort of shed some of his older Democratic kind of things he used to do, like give money to Democrats, uh, invite the Clintons to his wedding. You know, he, he wasn't, he was being ready to be a Republican. Um, but he still stood outside the party. And so part of the challenge for him in that context, particularly when, you know, the, in, in, after the, the primary campaign, was that I'm not sure how much of the, the party's professional campaign apparatus was actually available to him. Would they have worked for him? And of course, people are ambitious people. Lots of people like to get paid money uh, by a political campaign. So there's some. But it's not cream of the crop. And I don't know whether he could have brought those people on board, even if he had wanted to. So I, I will say that I, I'm sort of saying I, I do think there are, I will call them ideas that he has about how to campaign that I think of as being um, posing risks the way a presidential campaign should be run. I'm not sure even if he had decided he wanted to do these things, I'm not sure how much of the talent he could have recruited to his campaign. Maybe, though I'm underestimating um, people's willingness to, uh, to, to, to get paid. So. Um, and if you read the Art of the Deal, it's pretty clear that this is his whole strategy. You know, bad publicity is better than no publicity at all. Controversy sells. And that, that's how he's telling people to do business. And so it's how he thinks about his business. And I think it's just how, because he's an amateur, or as John likes to say, he's an apprentice, he thinks that's how you win political campaigns, too. Um, and so I, I, you know, like I don't, I don't know what's inside his head, but my look at it is that he really does want to win. Um, and one of the things I find really funny is like he has said twice now, I'm going to start raising money. Like I'm going to, you know, in the beginning he wasn't going to raise any money, and so we all said, okay, he's not, he doesn't have any donations because he's not trying. 
But now he said twice, like, I'm going to start raising money. And There's he's some. raised some, but like, where's the massive donations, you know, from all these people who are at these rallies? Like, there's that's a little odd to me, and I, I'm not sure what to make of that. Um, do we have time for? Yeah. Okay. What fact? I mean, he basically has his own news channel with Fox. So, what fact does that have? Well, they haven't always been kind to it. Well, so yeah, the question is, he, you know, Trump has his own news channel with Fox. Um, and it, you all may have noticed in the last few weeks in particular, his media um, uh, availability has always been exclusively to Fox. Um, you know, I, I, even yeah, despite the earlier feuds, right, with Megyn Kelly and, and so forth, um, of course, Roger Ailes now advising his campaign. Uh, so perhaps some of those feuds have been mended. You know, to me, um, I think the challenge with that as a, as a strategy is, um, you know, that's just niche marketing to people that already support you for the most part. I mean, it's you're not. It's the echo chamber. Yes, yeah, it's, it's the echo chamber. I mean, it's not really a, a, a way to, 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 an availability to Sean Hannity it, It's not a real way <laughs> to persuade swing voters, right, to no. come out and support you. Well, that's the question. You know, can you jack people up to get them out to vote? Um, you know, Lynn sort of alluded to this, but the the you know Republicans' base is pretty good about turning out. Um, I don't know that they need any more juicing. In a sense, it's Democrats that face that challenge when a lot of part of their base um, is just going to need that nudge, right, or some other additional motivation to, to make sure they show up and vote. Again, I just don't know that it's, maybe the way that I would think about it is, um, where is the highest value that Trump can get for each additional minute of his time or dollar spent or whatever it is? What's the, what's the best margin, right? You can go out there and find it. I don't think the best margin is having another, you know, uh, warm hug with Sean, you know, Sean Hannity. I don't really think that's um, that's maximizing the, his potential in terms of uh, winning votes that he doesn't already have. In the there was a hand over there, sir. You mentioned the glass ceiling earlier, um, and I know you're crunching all these numbers, but is there an intangible? I mean, what a historic thing we have going on here. You know, the first female president. How do you factor that into it? And maybe the good professor's on to something here that really Trump is Hillary's best campaigner. I mean, she's winning in spite of herself or because of him for the yeah, most part. Sense. Maybe he made that commitment when he went to, uh, when she went to his wedding. His wedding. <laughs> <laughs> we will make sure you get in there. <laughs> wedding present. Or he quits and then pinch slips in there and then we have a whole different I think that when we started thinking about writing this book, um, we thought that we were going to have to have a really clever way to track the role of gender attitudes in this election. Because we thought Hillary Clinton was going to be a factor. And it turns out that gender attitudes, you know, do you think these are, there's a whole bunch of work on this in psychology. Do women who complain about harassment cause more trouble than they saw? You know, like all these kinds of things. How do you feel about women working outside the home? Um, these things are having very little effect on vote choice in this election, but gender is huge, not because of Hillary Clinton, but because of Donald Trump. And so in this really strange way, sometimes people ask me, like, oh, well, do you think it's an accident that, you know, the first woman presidential candidate on a major ticket gets as an opponent, like, this, you know, bravado, just something, thumping machismo guy? And I'm like, yeah, I think that's an accident. You know, <laughs> I think it's an accident. But it has essentially made her, her gender kind of irrelevant by making gender so important because of his position on the treatment of women. Yeah, if Hillary was a man, if it was two guys up there arguing those things, the same points, would it, think it have a different effect? No, I do not. Yeah. Yeah. 
Do you, I mean, I we can we can actually do that test, and we should. That's a, that it's a good suggestion. The way we showed you about racial attitudes with the Clinton crews, and the, we can do that. You should go at it. We'll see how it works. Out. Well, yeah. <laughs> that's just constant. I, I will say. I will, I'll say. I'll say two things. I'll say um, the the most recent scholarship on on the role of gender in elections, looking at media coverage or voter behavior, um, has tended to find not a major effect, meaning that even though people do hold somewhat stereotypical attitudes about female and male candidates, which reflect some of the gender stereotypes that exist in the world at large, right? those, those stereotypes are not gone. Um, but it's not quite clear that, that they're the primary motivation for people's choices in elections in an era in which partisanship is so powerful. Right? So maybe you know, whether the candidates are Democrat or Republican just overrides their gender. Um, that work, I think, suggests that in a high salience presidential election, maybe gender will actually recede to the background. On the other hand, that's, these are studies of congressional elections, maybe gubernatorial or senatorial elections. The presidential election is a whole other ball of wax. And so maybe you would say, well, those are nice studies. It's cute that you did them in political science, but this is something so completely different that how could you begin to, to, to generalize from those studies to this thing? This is historic, like you said. So I was like, okay, that's a fair point. Let's, I'll go into it thinking, maybe we'll find something more than the current literature has found. And then, as sort of Lynn suggested, it's blowing me away that the election is much more about race, in some sense, than it is about gender. And to the extent it's about gender, it's about Trump's attitudes towards gender. And it may be the case that having Hillary there puts a lens on Trump's comments or allows her to react to Trump's comments in a way that is distinctive, that a different, I mean, that a man, a man would not. We have a good piece of evidence on this. Okay, what's the evidence? So in the primaries, yeah. a super PAC called Our Principles PAC, which was a Republican super PAC, ran the first attack ad on Trump for his comments about women. Um, if you haven't seen this ad, you should go watch it. It's called Quotes. It's just women um, reading things he said to the camera. it's just women with their iPhones reading direct quotes that Donald Trump, it was the first time that the electorate writ large had heard all these horrendous things that this man has said about women. And um, I'm in the field every week with this advertising experiment where we show people ads, and that ad tested amazingly well. And there was only one woman in that field, it was Carly Fiorina, and that ad wasn't really about her. Um, you know, like they were just trying to knock Trump down. And, and it was effective, and it didn't matter that it, Hillary Clinton wasn't part of that consideration. You know, we'll know also a little bit more when we can see on election day in the exit poll and other data, you know, the nature of the gender gap. Um, you know, did, are women and men farther apart? Are women more democratic than you might expect given sort of current trends? Are there particular groups of women that seem to have reacted in particular ways? I mean, of course, you can't necessarily say that's all about gender, right? There are other reasons for that. But uh, that's just to say that, you know, we don't have all the evidence we might need to, to, to shed some, some light on this. Um, there was a point, I think, in the spring when we were looking at some data over time, and you could really see some, uh, a break between men and women where it looked like the, the, the sort of greater attention to Trump's comments was pushing women towards saying they had strongly unfavorable views of him more than they were, it was pushing men. And again, we would be cautious. We can't say for sure that's due to the gender-related <coughs> comments, per se, or other things. Are you, but, thinking, are you thinking of the Afshat piece I wrote on that? Or a Tesla scrap, you did a piece on it, too. Okay, my, that, my thing was in the experiment. Yeah, I'm thinking, so of, another, case, thinking of another okay, another okay. piece of evidence. Okay, oh so, yeah, okay. You know, what you're dealing with, you, when you ask that question, we don't have an answer right yet. So <laughs> we're, we're working it out right now. But you know what brought it up is, is the Olympics. Uh, when they said more women watch Olympics than men, men watch it to see the results, who wins? Women watch it to see the side stories of how that one-legged guy won the race, you know? And, and, and so those things, like if, if a man was reading all those quotes, like yeah. you said in that Oh, man, I see what you're saying. Well, so, yeah, how would you react to it? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, it's, I think I thought you were going to expect the Olympics was the pushback that some commentators got for the way they described the achievements of female athletes. Oh, the Hungarian swimmer's husband. So important for her to have him as her coach. Okay, well, you know, lots of Michael Phelps is a dude coach too. Okay, it's not, <laughs> not his husband, right? But you know, he's just Michael Phelps. Um, so I, you know, one interesting thing, and I, I should say that um, when you have a conversation about an election, 
and you know, you're, you're so laser focused, as we all are, and Len and I too, on who's going to win the election. Um, you know, it is absolutely the case that, that if you're thinking about gender, um, that the election may have resonance in terms of how people think about gender or the politics of gender and culture writ large. Um, we've seen a number of things in the last several years that have drawn attention to sexual harassment and sexual assault, including on college campuses. Uh, Trump's comments about women have you know, drawn renewed attention, not just to Trump's comments, but to the issues at large. So there is an interesting question whether the, 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 deep, the, sort of the impact of gender or gender issues is not so much in who wins the election, even though we're so focused on that. But then maybe down the road we might look back and see that, not that this was a turning point in the history of gender relations of, of all time, but just to say that you know, there were some trends afoot in the culture and this campaign may have affected those trends or accelerated those trends or done something along those lines. Well, that remains to be seen. Um, but it, it's no question that the campaign has created conversations around these issues that previous campaigns haven't, in part because of Trump and in part because of Clinton. Um, and down the road, that could, be, that could be consequential or important. Just to give you one example of that, some of the political science research suggests that when younger women, girls and young women, see female office holders, that makes them feel sort of like they have more capacity to be engaged in politics and to succeed in politics. Right, so that's a downstream potential consequence of having Clinton as president that goes above just horse race considerations in this particular election. Yes, sir. Would, it's getting real late now for any kind of surprises that may be left in the bag. But do you think it's absolutely too late now, or could something else really make much of a break? We're kind of low on the game changers. We think very few things fundamentally switch outcomes of elections. Um, in fact, in the book that Keith was talking about, we coined the phrase game samer because all of these things that the journalists want to tell you were pivotal in, in 2012 we said, you know, one by one, not a game changer, a game saver. And, and we really think that's true. Um, and I think that, you know, whatever Julian Assange has or doesn't have, and, you know, whatever else is out there in the 33,000 hidden emails, and, you know, uh, God forbid, you know, terrorist attack or uh, something happens in Syria, I think those things are, those kinds of things are already baked in to this result. You know, what can I possibly tell you about Hillary Clinton that is going to change your view of her and your choice in this election? There's probably not much. Um, now, we were saying earlier uh, that if she goes on stage on Sunday night for that debate and in the middle of an answer faints and falls over, that's an unexpected, potentially game-changing moment. Um, and I, I think that, for me, would be like the only thing. Um, and I don't know, John might not even agree with me there, but like, if, you know, I mean, obviously, if, if one of the candidates is unable to continue, that's a completely different thing. But even just a, a major incident like that, I don't know what would happen. Yeah, I don't, I, I don't have a good hypothesis either about what's, what's beyond like just like earth shattering, improbable black swan kinds of events. I'm not quite sure what would be out there. I mean, the other thing I, I also tend to think about is, um, you know, six point margin in the polls, it's been a little bit larger than that in the past. It's been a little bit smaller than that in the past. It's not hard to imagine that moving a little bit, you know, either in her favor or in Trump's favor over time. You know, with, with five weeks left, it's not inconceivable. We've got two more debates, who knows? Uh, he comes that he calms himself down for the second debate. Seems like he learned, you know, does a little bit of prep, knows a few more things, can answer these town hall questions. The narrative now is, oh, that's the presidential Trump we've always been waiting to see, right? So that's a little more favorable to him, the polls sort of nudge closer together. You know, I can imagine those kinds of scenarios, but it's hard to imagine something that sort of is a six-point swing this late in the campaign in an era in which, as Lynn suggested, partisanship provides such a strong influence on people's choices and people's views of Clinton and Trump are, are pretty well crystallized and, and have probably been now months, if not years, depending uh, on how long they've been in politics. So, you know, again, bet, so, you know, what I was saying, bet the under, you know, <laughs> on a massive change in the electorate. Uh, but I, you know, I'm not going to say with 100% certainty that there's no possible thing. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
but the scenario might be as plausible as any. Okay. 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 Thank, Thank you guys. Thank you. Join us for the reception outside. Um, John and Lynn have to jet back to their homes at 5.30. So if you have any burning questions, I would rush up to them right now, but maybe right after they get a drink and something to eat. <laughs>